Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. I'm pleased today to welcome Mark Sloboda back to Wider View. Mark is an international relations and security analyst based in Moscow, and he talked with me from his home in Moscow via Skype. There are so many issues we could talk about today, I think, uh, particularly developments in the Middle East, the Korean Peninsula, but uh, let's start with the U.S. and Israeli provocations toward Iran. Um, Can you tell us where Russia stands on this whole uh, controversy around Iran and how Russia might respond if hostilities break out between the Iran and the U.S. or its regional proxies? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so first of all, that uh, Russia has good, normal relations with Iran, right? Uh, as as a normal country, they have normal diplomacy. Uh, they do normal business, um, and and uh, I, I would say even better, um, particularly in the last few years, uh, with uh, the U.S. attempts to overthrow uh, the Syrian government. Uh, and where that has forced Russia uh, in, into, you know, a de facto alliance, you know, not only with Syria, uh, but uh, also uh, with the Iranian government, Iran has has more and more developed as a strategic partner of Russia, right? So it's it's developed even more than normal good business like relations between countries, such that 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 Russia's relation. With, with Iran as well, certainly not as strong as as the relationship Russia's relationship with China. It is it is uh, uh, a fairly good relationship. The, the governments have have learned to uh, cooperate on uh, numerous issues: military, economic, um, uh, international, legal. Um, and where they do differ, uh, they have managed those differences well. Uh, in in all of the above, uh, and and the same is true in Syria. Russia and Iran do not always see eye to eye, uh, you know, on 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 you know the best way to to fight, uh, you know, the conflict, uh, the the best way to uh, reform uh, the Syrian government and military, uh, you know, um, who should get what share of rebuilding contracts and 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 you know. Uh, investment in the Syrian economy, all of these things that uh, Russia and Iran do not uh, are not always exactly on the same page. But I think that uh, contrary to many articles you might read in the Western press, hoping and you know praying of some titanic shift in relations between Russia and Iran, that's that's simply not going to happen. I think both governments are too mature and too realist about where they stand, not only, you know, via V each other, but but particularly via V the U.S. and the West, uh, that that's simply uh, not going to happen. And you have to understand that both countries are, are in similar places, not only in Syria, but both countries are being sanctioned. Uh, you know, uh, unilaterally without the remit of the security UN Security Council, uh, so essentially illegally under international law, at least technically, uh, uh, by the U.S. and and you know with with enough prodding by much of the rest of the West, um, and and that's true for both Russia and Iran uh, and, and and Syria. It must be said, so they, they find themselves you know with with common economic cause as well. And, um, you know, uh, Russia looks at what happened in Iraq when the U.S. attempted to overthrow the government there, what happened in Libya, what is continuing to happen in Syria. And they see that, you know, U.S. regime change efforts in Iran, which is, of course, a much larger, more coherent uh, uh, country than, than Iraq uh, you know, where Libya ever was, and they see the potential for geopolitical catastrophe uh, and and a true flames uh, engulfing the entirety of the Middle East this time, not just portions of it. Uh, they they see that a a a U.S. Israeli Saudi conflict, you know, with with the U.K. of course playing sidekick with Iran, uh, would of course draw in Hezbollah, um, the Palestinians. Um, it, um, Lebanon, uh, you know, uh, the, the rest of the country of Lebanon outside of Hezbollah, Iraq, which has very good brotherly relations with Iran as now a Shia majority, uh, technically, uh, 
a democracy, quote unquote, um, uh, and and Afghanistan, um, and and of course Syria, which is already in conflict. That the whole swath of the Middle East, and more than likely, you know, Yemen is already part of that conflict, uh, which brings in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, which has a very restive Shia. Uh, my uh, majority against a uh, Saudi-backed um, Sunni uh, monarchy as well. I, the, the entire that entire stretch of the Middle East would would be engulfed in flames, and obviously Russia does not want to see that. And so they are doing what they can to try to manage what is left of the joint comprehensive plan of action, to try to draw some daylight between the U.S. and the EU on this issue, with the EU also wanting to retain the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, if for no other reason as far as I can see than, than partisan politically to, to spite Trump and to give some credit to, to what they view as Barack Obama's legacy. I, I'm not sure if that amounts to anything more than that. Uh, and I don't, I'm very doubtful about their resolve on non-conflict uh, with Iran, but Russia is trying to find that daylight there, um, and Russia is, um, uh, you know, encouraging Iran to continue fulfilling the terms of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, as as best it can, as best Russia can argue, and as best as it is possible for Iran to continue. Uh, to fulfill the terms, because it's quite obvious from the, the technicality of it, that with the U.S. withdrawing and the renewed economic war on them, that there there are some parts of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action that it is it is now impossible for Iran to fulfill. Right. Well, and of course, as I think the Iranian leaders have said, you can't unilaterally uh, conform to a multilateral treaty. That really doesn't make sense to them. But, you know, the the thing that uh, I think many of us here are worried about is that um, our government uh, does not seem to have any kind of plan, does not seem to have really a good control over its military forces even, uh, and the likelihood that someone is going to stumble into a war situation is is uh, really likely. I mean, particularly we had even this week uh, an Iranian vessel or a vessel with Iranian oil aboard uh, stopped by the British uh, in uh, Gibraltar because because of illegal sanctions against Syria and um, and Iran. And there's a lot of people are talking about Iran, you know, taking some British tanker. And this this kind of thing could easily escalate. I mean, if this does, where will Russia side? Yeah, uh, first, I really want to address the, you know, this issue, uh, you know, this last incident here with the, uh, the, the British government through the uh, Gibraltar and authorities, although th th they claim they're acting independently in accord with EU laws. Uh, although uh, the, the behind the scenes chatter in all, even the Western mainstream papers, is that this is all being done at the direction of the Trump administration. Uh, certainly, I don't hear anyone from the EU saying we wanted this done or, you know, whose sanctions are supposedly being uh, enforced here. Um, uh, I haven't heard anyone within the, the, the ranks of, of the EU council, the EU uh, council presidency, anyone. Uh, you know, the EU foreign ministry, uh, foreign office, uh, you know, saying that, uh, you know, we wanted this this ship seized. And you know, all the more ironic is, of course, that the UK, the UK is rather messily and unhappily divorcing itself from the EU as all of this is going on. So that, you know, the fig leaf that this is done to support EU sanctions, first of all, is complete nonsense. First of all, these EU sanctions, as you pointed out, they are without the remit of the UN Security Council, which means they are an act of aggression. You know, the capital crime uh, in the UN Charter against international law, uh, they are illegal and, and, and unilateral. And there's no reason, you know, I mean, they're obviously their own countries will enforce them. But to 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 try to enforce them with military action 
militarily seizing a ship at sea uh, with Royal Marines to enforce them. That's a whole nother level. Without the remit of UN Security Council, you know, uh, that's piracy. That's that's state piracy and what it is. And, you know, this was done. It's still contested whether it actually took place in Spanish t territorial waters or, uh, you know, the international waters of Gibraltar, which is, is still uh, essentially a colony of the United Kingdom. And that that is politically contested, of course. Uh, but the, the Straits of Gibraltar are an international strait, which means there is international right of passage. Um, you know, it's... A, a, as if the ship was moving through international waters, meaning the British government has no right to seize that vessel. And once again, that is not that is an act of aggression. That is an act, uh, you know, not at that case, at that level, not just of piracy, but of war. That is that is an act of war by the United Kingdom on both Iran and Syria, I would argue, uh, because this is – technically it's a Panamanian flagged vessel, but it's owned by Iranians and it is being used uh, supposedly to ship oil from Iran to Syria. And the Syrian economy is desperate for oil because the entire eastern half of Syria, which has oil, is being militarily occupied by the United States – uh, and their proxy uh, forces. Uh, so this is a further attempt to make both the Iranian and the Syrian economies scream, right? And the situation is getting desperate in Syria, where people don't have gasoline to put in their cars or uh, heating oil to, you know, to cook or to heat their homes. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, is as seen as another attempt to make the people of Syria and Iran suffer to then have, you know, a, uh, some type of public unrest to put pressure uh, on uh, the government authorities. Um, and, and it's clearly a provocation. Does he, would Iran have, the, you know, what would be considered just cause to seal a, a British vessel in the Persian Gulf? Um, uh, uh, in uh, retaliation, I, I would say yes. But of course, that would also technically be illegal. And it is exactly probably what the, certainly the neocons in the U.S., like John Bolton and, and uh, Mike Pompeo and others, um, and the governments in Israel and Saudi Arabia and the United Kingdom, that's, that's exactly what they want. Because that would then, you know, uh, they would say they're just enforcing EU sanctions, you know, ne ne never mind the illegality of that, uh, but th they would term any retaliation by Iran as an, ag as an act of aggression. And, and then they would have exactly what they need for, you know, at the very least, airstrikes against Iran, against their air defense, against nuclear facilities. Uh, the, I've heard suggestions to attack the Iranian Navy and naval bases, um, etc., and where Russia stands all of this, of course, that it's extremely unlegal, right? And they've pointed out that the reactions from all type of officials and, and national security people in the countries involved indicate that, of course, it was premeditated. You know, this was, was planned and, and it's not something that happened ad hoc, you know, uh, by the, the, the government, uh, the authorities uh, in uh, Gibraltar. Um, and, and Russia views it as a as a dangerous provocation and one step closer to that war that, you know, Trump may have taken a brief pause step back from uh, in the last uh, two weeks. But that seems, you know, it, it is an inevitable, I believe, uh, drive towards that with too many forces, both within the U.S., the U.K., uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia that seem dead set on now or never uh, for, for conflict with uh, Iran. Uh, as I, I don't actually think I got to your question. The question is, how would Russia respond to a conflict? To, uh, let's say, you know, the, the, the first case scenario, which would be the U.S. Uh, with some allies, maybe, maybe Saudi Arabia, probably not Israel for geopolitical reasons, but with Saudi Arabia and some other allies, 
conducts airstrikes against uh, uh, Iran. Now, first of all, the, the simple logistics of that are, are actually more difficult than you might think, because there is no guarantee that Turkey would allow its military bases to be used, as Turkey actually has uh, at least warm economic relations uh, with Iran. And Iraq, Iraq would almost certainly not allow its military, uh, U.S. military bases in Iraq to be used against uh, uh, strikes in Iran. In fact, their constitution explicitly forbids it, uh, that, that foreign forces are not allowed to use uh, military bases to conduct attacks against neighbors. Uh, and if Iraq's government did do so under pressure from the United States, there would almost immediately be a civil war in Iraq, uh, you know, that, that would merge into the greater conflict. So the, the logistics of how to go about that, it would be crew. It would probably start with limited cruise missile and airstrikes, uh, you know, uh, possibly with stealth, uh, bombers and, and fighters and, and drones, um, against um, uh, Iranian uh, air defense, uh, which in, which includes uh, you know uh, Russian S four hundreds and three hundreds, so uh, you know not entirely um, uh, an easy target. There, there, there would be losses. Um, and um, air defense, command and control, nuclear facilities, which seem to be, you know, the you know the ostensible uh, reason for all of this anger. Civilian nuclear power plants, one of them built by Russia, um, and 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 very uh, p possibly uh, uh, navy and other military and uh, air bases, other facilities, such like that. You can see how it would quickly escalate. That list would grow. Retaliation against U.S. bases by Iranian allies. Be that the, the you know Houthis, um, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, Iraqi forces uh, that you know uh, are of you know uh, aligned with Iran, which is you know a very large part. Certainly, these uh, popular mobilization units, which are now an official part of the Iraqi uh, military, if not the army per se, I mean, it would escalate and blow out of all proportion. There would be retaliation of asymmetrical as well as symmetrical nature. Um, and 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 where would Russia come down on this? Uh, well, what? You can certainly expect is that Russia would provide political support by Iran uh, at the Security Council. Not that that means for much when when the U.S. and the U.K. of course have a veto at the Security Council, but at, at least you know they would condemn it. You know, in the strongest terms, there would be resolutions and vetoes flying and heart and you know strong words and you're doing this again and and so on. Uh, economically, Russia will help uh, Iran as much as possible. Um, uh, with probably much more effective mechanisms uh, than the EU's INSTEX attempt uh, to claim that they are attempting to still trade with Iran, uh, simply because Russia over the last uh, you know ten years has attained a great degree, not complete, but a great degree of decoupling from the U.S. Uh, uh, international uh, financial system that is, you know, still largely overseen by the U.S. And, and, and Russia simply, quite simply, doesn't do much trade with the U.S. <laughs> it didn't before. It does even less now. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing that, that could be done against Russia, uh, you know, which would be to to somehow try to force the EU to stop importing Russian energy would mean the end of the EU economically as well. Um, so, you know, that there's simply no leverage. There's not much economic leverage left to use against Russia that would not crash the entirety of the world's economy along with it, uh, including the U.S.'s. So, but is Russia going to intervene uh, militarily on behalf of Iran? No. No, 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 certainly not in the beginning. We have to remember that even in Syria, it took years of the conflict of developing. And only, only when it became obvious to Russia that Obama and Erdogan were planning to move from proxy war to a, a, an overt regime change, uh, you know, military invasion and, and airstrikes against Damascus. Only when the Russian government saw that that was what was coming next and was being planned and had uh, intelligence on that, um, that is only when they intervened. When it, it, they believed that the government in Damascus would fall, you know, to overt uh, 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 military uh, action by the U.S. And I don't think that Russia, I, it, it's actually quite hard to see how the U.S. 
uh, would achieve that in Iran. I mean, uh, they certainly wouldn't achieve it with air and, and cruise missile strikes, drones, and so on. Um, you know, they, they, they do lots of damage. There's no certainty about that. But it, it, it would only actually reinforce uh, the government as, as, as Iranians, which already largely support their government, contrary to popular Western belief, would even more rally around the government. Um, and a, a land invasion of 500,000 plus U.S. and allied troops in Iran, I, I don't think anyone sees that that's on the table because that is a minimum that it would take to overthrow the Iranian government. So I, I think Russia sees that, you know, military assistance to Iran, uh, you know, is is simply not necessary and, and might actually be detrimental. And then that might overtly lead into a World War III scenario at that point. But I think you can expect that Russia and China will would would provide military supplies, ammunition, you know, uh, what, what's what's remaining of UN Security Council uh, uh, weapons uh, um, sanctions against Iran, which are due to expire in 2020 anyway, uh, because of of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Uh, whether it continues or not, those those uh, sanctions will uh, expire, but they would probably go out the window even earlier. Um, and 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 Russia and China would 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 provide military you know uh, sales and logistics support to Iran. Um, and as well as much as much economic aid as they could. But I mean, it a, a battle in the Strait of Hormuz because Iran's so-called nuclear option is to close the Strait of Hormuz, through which 30 percent of the world's seaborne oil and energy trade passes through. Um, and and that would be such a messy conflict, not just for. Uh, you know, the U.S. and Iran, but for the entirety of the world economy. And ironically enough, what is the one country that would benefit from that? Russia, of course. <laughs> you're going to you're going to push the price if you're going to, you know, try to overthrow the Venezuelan government, you know, um, take Syrian oil off the international market. Um, you're going to uh, uh, take Iranian oil off the market and then. Uh, close, you know, uh, start a conflict which would see traffic through the Strait of Hormuz uh, uh, halted. Um, the oil, the price of oil is going to go sky high, and who's going to benefit from that? Russia. Uh, yeah, certainly not the U.S. Right? That will make the U.S. economy scream when Trump is moving into re-election. I, I don't believe that Americans vote on foreign policy, having been an American. <laughs> Uh, and in the military, I, I and you know, and and volunteered for the Democratic Party, um, you know, um, at, at, at various times in the past. Uh, I, I simply don't. There's no polling to suggest that Americans, at least not any significant portion of them, vote on foreign policy. But they do vote on their pocketbooks, which are affected the price of oil. And I'm not sure that that's a conflict that that Trump wants, uh, because he he's. I, I view him as a petty creature that is is, is primarily focused on his own ego, um, and and uh, you know at, at this point he wants re-election, and uh, however much John Bolton and Mike Pompeo and and, and others might be pushing, uh, you know him towards conflict with with Iran, I I think it's clear whatever else we may think of him, and I don't think much of him that he has reservations about that, and it's his own political re-election. Uh, that is because uh, he knows it, 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 if, if Venezuela was not an easy victory for him, as they told him, Iran would be a far, 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 far more uh, difficult um, situation. And, um, you know, again, if U.S. Iranian, uh, you know, if the U.S. attacked Iran, um, Iran is only going to move closer militarily and geopolitically towards Russia and China. And again, Russia wins. So. And this is really a cold, realist calculation, but that's the way the Kremlin thinks. I mean, let, let, let's let's be honest about that. And if I, I myself wish if only, you know, the rest of the world was uh, conducting their foreign policy by, you know, cold, transactional, realist policies, we'd probably have a much less warlike world. Um, but um, Russia is uh, it, it, it anything less then complete regime change in Tehran, Russia benefits from conflict with Iran. But 
Russia could also benefit from not conflict with Iran. So Russia wins either way. That was international relations and security analyst Mark Sloboda speaking to me from Moscow. Mark is not alone in his assessment. Stephen Blank, former professor of Russian national security at the U.S. Army War College, said, quote, I think Russia will try to prevent Iran from attacking Israel because they don't want to see Iran get into a war it will lose. What Russia will do is support Iran against the United States diplomatically and economically. There may be arms transfers, covert or overt, including air, air defense, short and intermediate range missiles, end quote. We also ought to remember that, as in so many previous U.S. aggressions, the stated justifications for a war against Iran are bogus. There is no evidence that Iran is rushing to build a nuclear weapon. In fact, U.S. intelligence has concluded that Iran halted its nuclear weapons program sometime between 2002 and 2004, and the Ayatollah has issued a fatwa against nuclear weapons. The recently floated notion that Iran has some connection with al-Qaeda is particularly ridiculous, since Iranian-backed forces have been fighting against al-Qaeda for years, while the U.S. has been supporting it. The other canard about Iran is that they are a main state sponsor of terrorism. This is also false. Iran does support Hezbollah, which is part of the government in Lebanon, and does provide an armed force that is vital to the defense of Lebanon, against Israeli aggression. Therein lies the real reason why the U.S. is so belligerent toward Iran. Israel sees Iran as a threat to their domination of the Near East, and Iran is opposed to the radical Sunni ideology being fostered by the Saudi government. If there is a war, it will be because the Israelis and the Saudis want it. The U.S. has no reason to fear Iran. We'll continue this discussion with Mark Sloboda next week when we discuss Putin's recent interview in the Financial Times and his observations on key trends in Western politics. The views expressed on Wider View are those of myself and my guests and may not reflect the views of the management of the radio station to which you're listening. Our aim is to provoke you to think outside the box and to question the narratives you hear from the mainstream media and our national leaders. I hope we have succeeded. If you want more information about this podcast or previous podcasts, go to widerviewradio.podbean.com where you will find an archive of all of our recent episodes. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 